Book Two of the Shadow and Bone Trilogy by Lee Bardugo, Siege and Storm. Chapter 17 Summer deepened, bringing waves of balmy heat to Azalta. The only relief to be found was in the lake or in the cold pools of the banya that lay in the dark shade of a birchwood grove beside the little palace. Whatever hostility the Rothkin court felt toward the Grisha, it didn't stop them from beckoning squalors and tidemakers to the grand palace to summon breezes and fashion massive blocks of ice to cool the stuffy rooms. It was hardly a worthy use of Grisha talent, but I was eager to keep the king and queen happy, and I'd already deprived them of several much-valued fabricators, who were hard at work on David's mysterious mirrored dishes. Every morning, I met with my Grisha council, sometimes for a few minutes, sometimes for hours, to discuss intelligence reports, troop movements, and what we were hearing from the northern and southern borders. Nikolai still hoped to take the fight to the Darkling before he dissembled the full strength of his shadow army, but so far Rothka's network of spies and informants had been unable to discover his location. It was looking more and more likely that we'd have to make our stand in Azalta. Our only advantage was that the Darkling couldn't simply send the Nietzsche Voya against us. He had to stay close to his creatures, and that meant he would have to march to the capital with them. The big question was whether he would enter Ravka from Fierda or from the Shuhan. Standing in the war room before the Grisha Council, Nikolai gestured to one of the massive maps along the wall. We took back most of this territory in the last campaign, he said, pointing to Ravka's northern border with Fierda. It's dense forest, almost impossible to cross when the rivers aren't frozen, and all the access roads have been blockaded. Are the Grisha stationed there? asked Soya. No, Nikolai said, but there are lots of scouts based out of Yelensk. If he comes that way, we'll have plenty of warning. And he would have to deal with the Petrozoi, said Paja. Whether he goes over or around them, it will buy us more time. She'd come into her own over the last few weeks. Though David remained silent and fidgety, she actually seemed glad to have time away from the workrooms. I'm more concerned with the permafrost, Nikolai said, running his hand along the stretch of border that ran above Sabaya. It's heavily fortified, but that's a lot of territory to cover. I nodded. Mal and I had once walked those wild lands together, and I remembered how vast they'd felt. I caught myself looking around the room, seeking him out, even though I knew he'd gone on another hunt, this time with a group of Kirch marksmen and Rovkin diplomats. And if he comes from the south, asked Zoya. Nikolai signaled Fyodor, who rose and began to walk the Grisha through the weak points of the southern border. Because he'd been stationed at Sakursk, the corporal that knew the area well. It's almost impossible to patrol all the mountain passes coming out of the Sykerzoi, he observed grimly. Shoe raiding parties have been taking advantage of that fact for years. It would be easy enough for the Darkling to slip through. Then it's a straight march to Azalta, said Sergei. Pass the military base at Politznaya, Nikolai noted. That could work to our advantage. Either way, when he marches, we'll be ready. Ready, Pavel snorted. For an army of indestructible monsters? They're not indestructible, Nikolai said, nodding to me. And the Darkling isn't either. I know, I shot him. Zoya's eyes widened. You shot him? Yes, he said. Unfortunately, I didn't do a very good job of it, but I'm sure I'll improve with practice. He surveyed the Grisha, looking into each worried face before he spoke again. The Darkling is powerful, but so are we. He's never faced the might of the first and second armies working in tandem, or the kinds of weapons I intend to supply. We face him. We flank him. We see which bullet gets lucky. While the Darkling Shadow Horde was focused on the little palace, he would be vulnerable. Small, heavily armed units of Grisha and soldiers would be stationed at two-mile intervals around the capital. Once the fighting began, they would close on the Darkling and unleash all the firepower that Nikolai could muster. In a way, it was what the Darkling had always feared. Again, I remembered how he described the new weaponry being created beyond Ravka's borders, and what he said to me so long ago beneath the caved-in roof of an old barn. The age of Grisha power is coming to an end. Paja cleared her throat. Do we know what happens to the Shadow Soldiers when we kill the Darkling? I wanted to hug her. I didn't know what might happen to the Nietzsche Voya if we managed to put the Darkling down. They might vanish to nothing, or they might go into a mad frenzy or worse, but she'd said it. When we kill the Darkling. Tentative, frightened, but it still sounded suspiciously like hope. We focused the majority of our efforts on Azalta's defense. The city had an ancient system of warning bells to alert the palace when an enemy was in sight. With his father's permission, Nikolai had installed heavy guns like those on the hummingbird above the city and palace walls. Despite Grisha grumbling, I'd had several placed on the roof of the little palace. They might not stop the Nietzsche Voya, but they would slow them. Tentatively, the other Grisha had begun to open up to the value of the fabricators. With help from the Inferni, the material kai were trying to create Grenaki that might produce a powerful enough flash of light to stall or stun the shadow soldiers. The problem was doing it without using blasting powders that would level everyone and everything around them. I sometimes worried that they might blow up the entire little palace and do the Darkling's work for him. 
More than once, I saw Grisha in the dining hall with burnt cuffs or singed brows. I encouraged them to try the more dangerous work by the lakeside with tie makers on hand in case of emergency. Nikolai was intrigued enough by the project that he insisted on getting involved in the design. The fabricators tried to ignore him, then pretended to indulge him, but they quickly learned that Nikolai was more than a bored prince who liked to dabble. Not only did he understand David's ideas, he'd worked long enough with the rogue Grisha that he'd slipped easily into the language of the small science. Soon, they seemed to forget his rank and his Otkazatsia status, and he could often be found hunched over a table in the material kai workshops. I was most disturbed by the experiments taking place behind the red lacquer doors of the Korporaki anatomy rooms, where they were collaborating with the fabricators to try to fuse Grisha steel with human bone. The idea was to make it possible for a soldier to withstand Nietzsche attack. But the process was painful and imperfect, and often the metal was simply rejected by the subject's body. The healers did what they could, but the ragged screams of the First Army volunteers could sometimes be heard echoing through the halls of the little palace. Afternoons were taken up by endless meetings at the Grand Palace. The Sun Summoner's power was a valuable bartering chip in Ravka's attempts to forge alliances with other countries, and I was frequently asked to put in appearances at diplomatic gatherings to demonstrate my power and prove that I was, in fact, alive. The Queen hosted teas and dinners where I was paraded out to perform. Nikolai often dropped by to dole out compliments, flirt shamelessly, and hover protectively by my chair like a doting suitor. But nothing was as tedious as the strategy sessions with the king's advisors and commanders. The king rarely attended. He preferred to spend his days hobbling after serving maids and sleeping in the sun like an old tomcat. In his absence, his counselors talked in endless circles. They argued that we should make peace with the Darkling or that we should go to war with the Darkling. They argued for a line with the shoe, then for partnering with Fierda. They argued every line of every budget from quantities of ammunition to what the troops ate for breakfast. And yet it was rare that anything got done or decided. When Vasily learned that Nikolai and I were attending the meetings, he put aside years of ignoring his duties as the Lansov heir and insisted on being there as well. To my surprise, Nikolai welcomed him enthusiastically. What a relief, he said. Please tell me you can make sense of these. He shoved a towering stack of ledgers across the table. What is this? Vasily asked. A proposal for repairs to an aqueduct outside of Chernitsyn. All this for an aqueduct? Don't worry, said Nikolai. I'll have the rest delivered to your room. There's more? Can't one of the ministers? You saw what happened when our father let others take over the business of ruling Ravka. We must remain vigilant. Warily, Vasily lifted the topmost paper from the pile as if he were picking up a soiled rag. It took everything in me not to burst out laughing. Vasily thinks he can lead as our father did, Nikolai confided to me later that afternoon throwing banquets, giving the occasional speech. I'm going to make sure he knows just what it means to roll without the Darkling or the Operat there to take the reins. It seemed like a good enough plan, but before long, I was cursing both princes beneath my breath. Vasily's presence ensured that meetings ran twice as long. He postured and preened, weighed in on every issue, held forth at length on patriotism, strategy, and the finer points of diplomacy. I've never met a man who can say so much without saying anything at all, I fumed as Nikolai walked me back to the little palace after a particularly wretched session. There's got to be something you can do. Like what? Get one of his prize ponies to kick him in the head. I'm sure they're frequently tempted, Nikolai said. Vasily's lazy and vain, he likes to take shortcuts, but there's no easy way to govern a country. Trust me, he'll tire of it all soon enough. Maybe, I said, but I'll probably die of boredom before he does. Nikolai laughed. Next time, bring a flask. Every time he changes his mind, take a sip. I groaned. I'd be passed out on the floor before the hour was up. With Nikolai's help, I'd brought in armaments experts from Politsnaya to help familiarize the Grisha with modern weaponry and give them training in firearms. Though the sessions had started out tensely, they seemed to be going more smoothly now, and we hoped that a few friendships might be forming between the first and second armies. The units of Grisha and soldiers who had been assembled to hunt down the Darkling when he approached Azalta made the fastest progress. They returned from training missions full of private jokes and new camaraderie. They even took to calling each other Nolniki, zeros, because they were no longer strictly first or second army. I've been worried about how Bakken might respond to all the changes. But the man seemed to have a gift for killing, no matter the method, and he delighted in any excuse to spend time talking weaponry with Tolya and Tamar. Because the shoe had a bad habit of taking a scalpel to their Grisha, few survived to make it to the ranks of the second army. Bakken loved being able to speak in his native tongue, but he also loved the twins' ferocity. They didn't rely on their Korporaki abilities the way Grisha raised up the little palace tended to. Instead, heartrending was just one more weapon in their impressive arsenal. Dangerous boy, dangerous girl, Bakken commented watching the twins spar with a group of Korporaki one morning while a clutch of nervous summoners waited their turn.
Marie and Sergei were there, Nadia trailing behind them as always. Chief worth than he if, complained Sergei. Tamar had split his lip open and he was having trouble talking. I feel far for her huffoon. We'll not marry, said Bakken as Tamar threw a hapless inferni to the ground. Why not? I asked, surprised. Not her, not brother either, said the mercenary. They are like Bakken, born for battle, made for war. Three Kroparaki heard themselves at Toya. In moments, they were all moaning on the floor. I thought of what Toya had said in the library, that he wasn't born to serve the Darkling. Like so many Shu, he'd taken the path of the soldier for hire, traveling the world as a mercenary and privateer. But he'd ended up at the little palace anyway. How long would he and his sister stay? I like her, said Nadia, looking wistfully at Tamar. She's fearless. Bakken laughed. Fearless is other word for stupid. I wouldn't fay that to her faith, grumbled Sergei as Marie dabbed his lip with a damp cloth. I found myself starting to smile and turned aside. I hadn't forgotten the way the three of them had welcomed me to the little palace. They hadn't been the ones to call me a whore or try to throw me out, but they certainly hadn't spoken up to defend me, and the idea of pretending friendship was just a little too much. Besides, I didn't quite know how to behave around them. We'd never truly been close, and now our difference in status felt like an unbridgeable gap. Jenya wouldn't care, I thought suddenly. Jenya had known me. She'd laugh with me and confided in me, and though Shiny kept her title would have kept her from telling me exactly what she thought or slipping her arm through mine to share a bit of gossip. Despite the lie she'd told, I missed her. As if in answer to my thoughts, I felt a tug on my sleeve and a tremulous voice say, Moi sauverigny? Nadia stood shifting from foot to foot. I hoped. What is it? She turned to a murky corner of the stables and gestured to a young boy in ethereal kai blue whom I'd never seen before. He approached nervously, fingers twisting in his kefta. This is Adric, Nadia said, placing her arm around him. My brother. The resemblance was there, though you had to look for it. We heard that you planned to evacuate the school. That's right. I was sending the students to the one place I knew with dormitories and space enough to house them, a place far from the fighting, Kirimzin. Bakken would go with them too. I hated to lose such a capable soldier, but this way the younger Grisha would still be able to learn from him, and he'd be able to keep an eye on them. Since Bagra wouldn't see me, I'd sent a servant to her with the same offer. She'd made no reply. Despite my best attempts to ignore her slights, the repeated rejection still stung. You're a student, I asked Adric, pushing the thoughts of Bagra from my mind. He nodded once, and I noted the determined thrust to his chin. Adric was wondering, we were wondering if, I want to stay, he said fiercely. My brow shot up. How old are you? Old enough to fight. He would have graduated this year, put in Nadia. I frowned. He was only a couple of years younger than I was, but he was all bony elbows and rumpled hair. Go with the others to Karimzin, I said. If you still want to, you can join us in a year. If we're still here. I'm good, he said. I'm a squalor, and I'm as strong as Nadia, even without an amplifier. It's too dangerous. This is my home. I'm not leaving. Audric, Nadia chastised. It's okay, I said. Audric seemed almost feverish. His hands were balled into fists. I looked at Nadia. You're sure you want him to stay? I, began Audric. I'm talking to your sister. If you fall to the Darkling's army, she's the one who will have to mourn you. Nadia paled slightly at that, but Audric didn't flinch. I had to admit he had metal. Nadia worried the inside of her lip, glancing from me to Audric. If you're afraid to disappoint him, think what it will be like to bury him, I said. I knew I was being harsh, but I wanted them both to understand what they were asking. She hesitated, then straightened her shoulders. Let him fight, she said. I say he stays. If you send him away, he'll just be back at the gates a week from now. I sighed, then turned my attention back to Adric, who was already grinning. Not a word to the other students, I said. I don't want them getting ideas. I jabbed a finger at Nadia, and he's your responsibility. Thank you, Masa Vereni, said Adric, bowing so low I thought he might tip over. I was already regretting my decision. Get him back to classes. I watched them walk up the hill toward the lake, then dusted myself off and made my way to one of the smaller training rooms, where I found Mal sparring with Pavel. Mal had been at the little palace less and less lately. The invitations had started arriving the afternoon he returned from Balakarev. Hunts, house parties, trout fishing, card games. Every nobleman and officer seemed to want Mal at his next event. Sometimes he was gone for an afternoon, sometimes for a few days. It reminded me of being back at Karimzin, when I would watch him ride away and then wait each day at the kitchen window for him to return. But if I was honest with myself, the days when he was gone were almost easier. When he was at the little palace, I felt guilty for not being able to spend more time with him, and I hated the way the Grisha ignored him or talked down to him like a servant. As much as I missed him, I encouraged him to go. 
It's better this way, I told myself. Before he deserted to help me, Mal had been a tracker with a bright future, surrounded by friends and admirers. He didn't belong standing guard in doorways or lurking at the edges of rooms, playing the role of my dutiful shadow as I went from one meeting to the next. I could watch him all day, said a voice behind me. I stiffened. Zoya was standing there. Even in the heat, she never seemed to sweat. You don't think he stinks of caroms in? I asked, remembering the vicious words she had once spoken to me. I find the lower classes have a certain rough appeal. You will let me know when you're through with him, won't you? I beg your pardon? Oh, did I misunderstand? You two seem so close. But I'm sure you're setting your sights higher these days. I turned on her. What are you doing here, Zoya? I came for a training session. You know what I mean. What are you doing at the Little Palace? I'm a soldier of the Second Army. This is where I belong. I folded my arms. It was time Zoya and I had this out. You don't like me, and you've never missed an opportunity to let me know it. Why follow me now? What choice do I have? I'm sure the Darkling would gladly welcome you back at his side. Are you ordering me to leave? She was striving for her usual haughty tone, but I could tell she was scared. It gave me a guilty little thrill. I want to know why you're so determined to stay. Because I don't want to live in darkness, she said. Because you're our best chance. I shook my head. Too easy. She flushed. Am I supposed to beg? Would she? I found I didn't mind the idea. You're vain. You're ambitious. You would have done anything for the Darkling's attention. What changed? What changed? She choked out. Her lips thinned and her fists clenched at her sides. I had an aunt who lived in Novokurbersk. A niece. The Darkling could have told me what he meant to do. If I could have warned them. Her voice broke and I was instantly ashamed of the pleasure I'd felt at watching her squirm. Bagra's voice echoed in my ears. You're taking to power well. As it grows, it will hunger for more. And yet, did I believe Zoya? Was the sheen in her eyes real or pretense? She blinked her tears back and glared at me. I still don't like you, Starkov. I never will. You're common and clumsy, and I don't know why you were born with such power. But you're the Sun Summoner, and if you can keep Bravka free, then I'll fight for you. I watched her, considering, noting the two bright spots of color that had flamed high on her cheeks, the trembling of her lip. Well, she said, and I could see how much it cost her to ask. Are you sending me away? I waited a moment longer. You can stay, I said, for now. Is everything all right? Mal asked. We hadn't even noticed that he left off sparring. In an instant, Zoya's uncertainty was gone. She gave him a dazzling smile. I hear you're quite the marvel with a bow and arrow. I thought you might offer me a lesson. Mal glanced from Zoya back to me. Maybe later. I look forward to it, she said, and swept away in a soft rustle of silk. What was that about? He asked as we began the walk up the hill to the little palace. I don't trust her. For a long minute, he said nothing. Alina, Mal began uneasily. What happened in Kabursk? I cut him off quickly. I didn't want to know what he might have done with Zoya back at the Grisha camp. And that was hardly the point. She was one of the Darkling's favorites, and she's always hated me. She was probably jealous of you. She broke two of my ribs. She what? It was an accident, sort of. I'd never told Mal exactly how bad it had been for me before I'd learned to use my power. The endless, lonely days of failure. I just can't be sure where her real allegiance lies. I rubbed the back of my neck where the muscles had started to bunch. I can't be sure of anyone, not the Grisha, not the servants, any of them could be working for the Darkling. Mal looked around. For once, nobody seemed to be watching. Impulsively, he seized hold of my hand. Gritsky's throwing a fortune-telling party in the upper town two days from now. Come with me. Gritsky? His father is Stepan Gritsky, the Pickle King. New money, Mal said in a very good imitation of a smug noble. But his family has a palace down by the canal. I can't, I said, thinking of the meetings, David's mirrored dishes, the evacuation of the school. It just felt wrong to go to a party when we could be at war in a matter of days or weeks. You can, said Mal, just for an hour or two. It was so tempting to steal a few moments with Mal away from the pressures of the little palace. He must have sensed that I was wavering. We'll dress you up as one of the performers, he said. No one will even know that the Sun Summoner is there. A party, late in the evening, after the day's work was done. I'd miss one night of futile searching through the library. What was the harm in that? All right, I said. Let's go. His face broke into a grin that left me breathless. I didn't know if I'd ever get used to the idea that a smile like that might actually be for me. Zoya and Tamar won't like it, he warned. They're my guards. They follow my orders. Mal snapped to attention and swept me an elaborate bow. Da, Mosavarini, he pronounced in somber tones. We live to serve. I rolled my eyes, but as I hurried to the Materialkai workrooms, I felt lighter than I had in weeks.